from a standpoint, I mean, the, the, the beauty of my job is I don't necessarily have to do anything hard. I don't manage infrastructure. Um, I don't, I'm not responsible for profit and loss. Uh, I don't sell anything other than our subscription research, of course. Um, what I do try to do is to make sense of things and, and to try and synthesize um, what I hear from customers uh, and from vendors. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the landscape. I'm going to talk about where, um, in my view, though, the things are going to go to, um, uh, where we're evolving as, uh, uh, from the uh, attack and defense standpoint, and then some point of advice for, for, uh, for vendors. Anybody here work for a vendor of any kind, security vendor? OK, um, just a few words of what sort of vendors, security vendors, maybe? Anybody work for an antivirus vendor? OK, excellent. There's a couple like <laughs> sort of in the back. Yeah, OK. Anti-spam, but email. Yeah. So, so, this won't, so this may or may not win me any points. If you've got rotten fruit, I advise you to shelve it for now. Uh, first, you know, and, and this is the obligatory advertisement. I, I'll do this. It'll take me 10 seconds. Um, who's Yankee Group? Um, we're an analyst firm here in Boston. We actually are in the Peru, so we're, we're neighbors to, to uh, some of the folks here that came locally. Uh, we're founded in 1970. We've got a lot of analysts, a lot of different places. Um, we're owned by a private equity company, and um, we do lots of research around um, what we refer to as the global connectivity revolution. And, and what that really means is the impact of, um, it, the way I would define it is um, uh, miniaturization, dense programming, uh, computing power, open platform stacks, and lots and lots of bandwidth. The impact that's having on everybody. So advertisement off. Um, next question, who am I? Weld kind of introduced me. Um, but I'll just put up the the uh, the obligatory vanity slide. Um, uh, I'm an analyst. I was a founder of At Stake, along with some of the other folks in the room here. Um, previously with, with uh, System Integrator of the Day. By the way, some people tell me that's the best photograph ever taken of me. So, um, And I wrote a book. Um, the obligatory book plug is here. Um, buy this book. It's great. Everybody says so. It has a frog on the cover. And of course, it makes a great gift. <laughs> OK, so all the, the obligatory plug stuff aside, um, we'll talk a little bit about what I'm seeing in the malware landscape. So first thing, um, at least from my standpoint, I'm going to move this down because I'm sure I'm turning metallic on everybody. Um, the, the first thing I'm seeing is that the, uh, I don't think this is news to anybody here in the audience, but the, 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 the zero day, and I say this with a grain of salt, given the, the audience I'm speaking to here, um, the, the, the Exploits are become increasingly sophisticated. Now, I've mentioned, uh, if you saw in the obligatory vanity slide and you're a speed reader, you would have noticed that I work for Federal Express. Uh, Federal Express is a supply chain company. And I, I tend to view the world through the lens of supply chain because I think it's very useful. And I think certainly in the security world, where we look at the progression of things that start out as theoretical breaks and work their way through into finished exploits, uh, follows a nice supply chain analogy. And so um, my view is that, you know, uh, things that start off as software flaws uh, become uh, mined, discovered by people that, that turn them into uh, raw materials, exploits, if you will, theoretical breaks. Those get assembled into uh, working code, kitted up into attack kits, and then distributed uh, throughout a network of, of distributors. There's a, there's, I think a, there's a bias, I think, in the security world, and I saw this um, in my previous employer, uh, to, to deride uh, a lot of the, the, the folks who use scripted exploits and things as script kitties. Um, that is, uh, is probably a grave insult to kitties, um, but it's also missing the point, and that is that, that they're, they're functioning parts of a supply chain whose job is to manufacture stuff that gets distributed to unwitting end users. Uh, so simply calling them, calling them script kitties um, is, is sort of like calling, you know, Best Buy uh, people who sell, you know, who sell radios or whatever. I mean, they have an important part to play in the landscape. So just from, you know, I've kind of laid out the, the taxonomy here. The, the raw materials, in my view, are, are mined by the vulnerability researcher. Uh, in many cases, they're often done by opposition teams, uh, well-funded groups in the usual places, you know, Eastern Europe and so forth. Um, those are kitted up. Um, sometimes you see them posted on proof of concept code sites. Uh, turn into exploits and, 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 and circulate it. I don't think this is news to anybody. It may be a little different way of looking at the whole thing. But certainly this is, the, the, I think what we're seeing is the, the emergence of a mature supply chain, where before it was just sort of security, things are happening and things are getting compromised. And, uh, um, 
but I think there's a real pattern to it and there's a degree of specialization and maturity that frankly would make Michael Dell weep were he in this business. Um, second is the, uh, the emergence of the web as the, uh, as the preferred super distribution platform for malware. And we, certainly we see this from a trend standpoint. Every vendor we speak to will tell us that, uh, that the presence of airborne malware in terms of email is a decreasing, an increasingly uh, 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 less important source. And more often you see things like drive-by exploits. Um, the notion that you could um, simply uh, get malware by doing normal everyday things. Um, how many people have had a conversation like this? Hopefully nobody, right? Because we're all you know, security people. But where you go to a party and, and, somebody, and, and, and you say to somebody, oh man, my PC just got hosed. I got infected by you know, a virus or rootkit. Pick your word of choice, right? And the other person turns to you and says, gee, what sort of websites have you been surfing to? It used, that used to be the prevailing conversation. Now, uh, you see that, that this, that's not necessarily the case. I, I think we've seen results from Google and McAfee and a bunch of others that will tell you that 10% of, of every set of search results that returned by Google, for instance, has malware in it. So that tells me if you do any level of searching for any period of time, you are inevitably going to come in contact with this stuff. And your susceptibility to it depends on what you've got on your PC. So, the, the, the notion being here that the web is a phenomenally great way of circulating information. It's an even better way of circulating malware, and we're seeing this. Um, I've left a, a couple of highlights here. Um, it's amazing to me the, the amount of sophistication that we're seeing in the exploit attack kits. And I've mentioned a few here. We've got things like Neosploit, um, which is uh, essentially designer malware, one-to-one -one malware. Um, if anybody here like uh, nice clothes where you go and you have made to measure suits and things, this is made to measure malware. It's just for you. It'll check your operating system, it'll check what patch level you're at, and then just create a nice little exploit for you dynamically on the fly and something that's never been seen before and will never be see seen again. Um, Zunker is something that was found by a, a security company called Panda. They're a Spanish based antivirus company. Um, it has a nicer user interface than my ISP control panel that I use to host my website. Phenomenally good. You know, it'll show you the nodes that are infected, what they've got on them, what IM programs they're running, what email programs. You can automatically cause them to generate spam, download arbitrary executables, run them. I mean, it's fantastic remote control. The, the people at Unicenter would love to copy this, right? Just fantastically good. Um, you see other things. Uh, I don't think, again, this will come as a surprise to anybody. Um, we've seen loopholes in DNS. The whole fact, fast flux phenomenon uh, of exploiting um, uh, uh, aspects of the, do, of the domain name regist registration system. Um, and we've seen, you know, I think what, what's helping here is that we, we've seen ISPs increasingly reluctant to um, uh, police their networks, unless it's for, you know, Hollywood movies. Um, the, the, uh, there, a couple years ago, we started hearing about uh, this notion of clean pipes, the idea that you would. Uh, somehow scrub your, your ISP's network of malware floating over it. It hasn't really gone anywhere, and a lot of it is uh, for reasons having to do with this allergy uh, about being anything other than a common carrier. Um, last point I'd make, and I don't think this is a surprise to anybody, um, you do see direct damages from, from this. We've seen on the SEC filings of E-Trade and TD Ameritrade, we've seen write-downs that were explicitly attributed to malware. So no ifs, ands, or buts about it. This was our customers lost money because they got hosed. We've reimbursed them for their trade losses, and this is what it cost us. Uh, amazing, amazing transparency, and we have the SEC to thank for that. Um, generally, you know, this is, a, this is one of these um, content-free schematic kinds of slides that is a synthesis of a lot of data. Um, I would not take the figures literally, but I would take the trend fairly literally. And that is that there's a very deliberate attempt of uh, of decreasing the amount of widely circulated variants in favor of large numbers of small circulated variants. Um, if, if yesterday's malware was Budweiser, now everybody's trying to distribute lots and lots of Sam Adams and, and Harpoon malware. So small batch craft brewed kinds of stuff. And the idea is real simple. It's that uh, most of the AV labs prioritize what they go after in terms of the number of infections they hear about. Right, so they don't hear about a lot of infections, it must not be very serious. Well, the way you get around this, of course, is you send a lot of little tiny uh, viruses that aren't detected very often, and you change, you know, you change the, the, uh, the, sig uh, the signature, you change the content enough, 
it causes them to go right under the radar. And so you see this as a result of the number of samples that most of the labs are reported. Um, depends on who you ask. Uh, I think it was Kaspersky, keep me honest here, just reported a million. Okay, just reported a million. Uh, McAfee reported uh, 300,000 signatures about six months ago. Virus Total folks will tell you they have six million samples. Uh, Symantec says they've got about a half million. I mean, it just goes on and on. The idea is you see this vertical hockey stick. Um, if, if, if these were VC, you know, these were revenues associated with a VC company, the VC would be very excited. This is the hockey stick in action. A 10x in. A lot of them are That's absolutely true, but it's part of a strategy of, frankly, deni of denial of service. I mean, you know this, right? It's a denial of service against the labs. Um, and uh, I did a sample. I, I probably should update the data here. Um, I just, just for grins, I looked at the, the, uh, the sites of uh, Symantec and McAfee and looked at their top 125 circulating viruses of the moment, just a snapshot. Every single one of them was, was called low risk, which is to say every single one of them was low, uh, low frequency, low distribution. So, so you can see where we're headed. Asymptotically, we're going to that designer malware. One signature, one victim. Um, this is, uh, uh, this is based on some research I did last year. Um, it was, it was a, a single instance of a particular piece of malware that was circulating. Um, I actually called around the different, uh, some of the different vendors to try and figure out uh, when, when it was first spotted uh, and when signatures were issued. Uh, I found an instance of, um, of Prevex, which is a HIPS uh, host intrusion prevention vendor uh, based in the UK, detecting a certain thing they called cold case on the 10th of March. Um, it took, you know, two weeks, 16 days or so in order to, uh, in order to actually generate signatures and get them, get them circulated with the bulk of them all happening, you know, about uh, almost two weeks later. Now, I'm, I'm, this, is probably, this is a cherry-picked example, but it, it, the, the point is, is that, that there's a lot of stuff out there and it's impossible for everybody to catch everything. So um, we're seeing that the defenses are frankly not catching up with this low and slow style malware. Small, small number of samples and lots of them. Um, this, this particular slide got me into trouble. I, I did this at, I gave a um, keynote at Microsoft's uh, Safety and Security Summit last year and this particular slide I think caused uh, my hosts a little heartburn. Um, I put, I showed it anyway. Um, <laughs> but the, the uh, Windows, you know, is frankly under permanent siege at this point and, and this is you can argue about whether it's a monoculture effect or what, or it's economics or platform security. You know, you can argue this 10 ways to Sunday, but the point is uh, it is under permanent siege now. And, um, and the reasons are clear. First, the money's too good. Botnets, um, I compare this to, to a franchise model. It's like McDonald's. There are hundreds or thousands of these that are set up. Uh, and frankly, there's far too many of them for any law enforcement body, uh, singly or collectively, to take down. Um, you, most of you have seen the news probably about the storm botnet. Um, Peter Gutmann, who I don't believe is here, uh, compared the computing power resident in the storm botnet as being more powerful than the most powerful uh, supercomputer on the planet. Um, we've seen empirically, we've done research that shows that even though 99% of enterprises have antivirus, uh, somewhere between half to two-thirds of them get infected on an annual basis uh, in, in a serious enough way that will cause uh, a business unit to be disrupted. Um, and I found anecdotally that um, in terms of a lot of people that I talk to that are security conscious, they're not even using Windows anymore. Um, I run a mailing list called securitymetrics.org. We've got about 400 people. I surveyed everybody and we did a little, we tried to figure out who uses what. We found that about 40% uh, of them use Windows, um, more, th more than 40 used Mac, and about 18% use Linux. Uh, certainly disproportionate. And, and could, yes, sir. Could you amplify uh, support intelligence using public shame as a motivator? Sure. Are you from support intelligence? No. Okay. Excellent. Um, the, uh, there, was a, there was a little study. Um, I'm familiar with them, actually. There was a little study uh, that they did. A year, they're not a client of mine, so I can, I can say this um, and, and not be too worried about conflict of interest. They did a study. Um, right excellent. Even better. But they did a, a study um, where they uh, called um, the month of owned corporations. And they basically posted um, the names of companies inside of which they'd found botnets. And they, you know, this was done through the usual extrusion monitoring kinds of techniques. 
Uh, and it's you know companies you've heard of. You know, um, I'm going to get this wrong, but it's like you know Motorola and Merck and Johnson and Johnson and American Express and all kinds of you know household name companies. Um, if anybody here works for any of those companies, and I've, de I've managed to defame you by naming them un uh, inaccurately, I'm sorry about that. Um, but it was a great study, and it was the idea was very much like the scarlet letter thing of, of putting them in a in a stockade out in a public square and saying, you know, look at you. Um, and I thought it was nice. I thought it was a nice PR move, um, <laughs> certainly for support intelligence. But it also spotlighted, I think, a growing uh, the, a growing point, which is that um, this stuff it's it, this stuff happens to a lot of companies right now. I'll revisit this in a minute. Um, now, the, the reason why the malware authors won't give up, of course, uh, is for the reason you'd expect. Uh, it's all about the Benjamins, right? It, it, the money's too good. Um, and this is essentially what's fueling the permanent siege that we're talking about. The enemy is very well financed. Um, the dirty secret is that everybody's losing ground. Um, they're not back. They're not making it up. Uh, I have conversations with a lot of uh, antivirus companies as part of my research, and these are these are direct quotes from people that I've talked to um, that are either associated with their labs or are close to it, and they all say more or less the same things. Uh, you know, one of them said. Uh, the only way we've been able to keep up is by throwing bodies at the problem. Another one said we had more malware samples last year than we did in the previous 10 combined. Um, this is that 10x hockey stick that we're talking about. Uh, my favorite, and they've owned up to this publicly, is Panda said the bad guys are mounting a denial of service attack against our labs. And that is exactly right. Um, it is looking for the weak knee and, and going right at it. If, if humans are part of the screening process for determining what's good or, go or bad, uh, and automation uh, is, can only go so far, then uh, this is what you do. You target the people. Um, so, you know, and I would point out just from a numbers standpoint, if you assume 90% of your samples can be classified automatically, and 10% of them require manual intervention, if, you know, the, if the hockey stick keeps going, it means that you have as many samples to classify this year as you did in 2004. Right, 2004 was not exactly a great year for malware. There was plenty of it then too. So you can see how you can see how, how this is going. Um, so let, let me let me talk a little bit to the the evolution side. Uh, I painted kind of a bleak picture, and um, so let's talk about some some good news. Well, I don't know if it's good news or not. We'll see. So uh, the first the first question, and I'll ask this just. As rhetorically, um, what what do, what do people think the biggest problem facing the the AV industry as we know it is? Okay. Free. Free. Free products. Free products. Okay. It doesn't work. That's a that's certainly certainly a concern. I would say. Yeah. A lack of OS level modeling of proper application behavior. That's pretty good, actually. But you're all wrong. <laughs> the biggest problem is the industry itself. Um, specifically, um, a, a general unwillingness to admit that we're losing, a, an unwillingness to admit the problem is bigger than any one party. Um, you see constant speeds and feeds, one, one upmanship, uh, an unwillingness to hush the marketers. Uh, there's a, a very prominent vendor that has a product called Total Protection, as if. <laughs> uh, and, and a total unwillingness to measure effectiveness. Most of you, I pimped my book at the beginning on security metrics, right? So people know that I like data. Um, why can't I find what customers are infected at any one moment? I, I don't know. Is it, is it because the, the various vendors are embarrassed or because they don't know? I think it's a combination of both. Um, I saw a stat from around the WMF uh, exploit circulation in December of, uh, I think it was 2004. Um, and the, I saw a very quick quote from a, somebody at McAfee who was not identified by name. And I searched and searched and searched, couldn't figure out who it was. And they said that 5% of their global customer base was infected. And that was the, that's the only time I've ever seen anything in print about, about whether this stuff was working in the field or not and to what extent. Um, and there's an unwillingness, I think, as well to band together. Um, Gary McGraw has made the point, I think, quite well that the bad guys are doing a better job sharing information than the good guys. Are you looking for numbers that are made up? Yes. <laughs> Got any? Yeah, I mean, True Secure has a bunch of numbers, and I guess it's kind of culturalized with this. Uh, they, they have a bunch of numbers about how their approach works, and yeah. everybody else does it, and all yeah. numbers are made up, and I make most of them up. So. 
Yeah. Well, Pete Tippett will tell you that there's this magic mode called default deny that if you just put all your routers into, we'd solve all our problems, right? So, but, but we don't know what those practices are because it's not public. You have, public. To, you have to pay them, right. OK. <laughs> it's kind of like research, actually. Very much like research. So, OK, so, um, so, what do, so what do we need? Uh, I'm going to just t tell you a little bit about what I see from an analyst standpoint about where we're headed. Um, the first is uh, I'll talk a little bit about something that, that um, did get a little write-up in the press a couple weeks ago called herd intelligence. Uh, and this is the notion of using every endpoint as a collector. And, and, and putting quite a bit of what we have into the cloud and making smarter decisions. Um, I will breeze past the virtualization side of things. Certainly, this is helping the idea of creating a virtualized machine that enables you to simulate infections and, and automate the ability to determine good from bad. Um, malware detection, I'm going to spend a little time on this. The, the notion that prevention is no longer guaranteed, so detection is the most important thing you have to do. And there's a lot of head nods here, so that's good. Um, metrics, uh, what's working, what's not, um, and, and, and doing it in a more public way. Um, you know, for instance, what are your processing queue lengths if you're an AV lab? How long are things kicking around in your queue? This is good information to share. It could be used against you, but it's also, I think, a good industry benchmark that would give you an idea of whether you're getting better or getting worse at the problem. Customer benchmarking. Um, you see this from the threat standpoint of, um, we caught a million spam messages aimed at financial services. Well, you know, great. Um, but how many, how many of those actually resulted in infections in financial services? How many outbound viruses were caught uh, in investment banking versus insurance and so forth? Um, we'd all like to know. And then um, there are some things that we need on an industry-wide basis. First, I think we need some common, some common services. Um, I've, I'd like to see, and I know this is um, uh, a fantastic solution, fantastic meaning fantasy, um, I'd like to see a global whitelist uh, for, for Goodware. Um, we've seen, you know, Sun, for instance, has had its SunSolve fingerprint database. It's been, it's seven years old. Um, I, I, it it, it kind of boggles the mind about why we don't have something like this in the Windows world. Yes? Uh, NIST actually does have something like that. It's a, a really, relatively large database, but they only use it for forensics for law enforcement, so access to it is restricted. That's but a there is data know. like that. Would be it would be good to see that fed um, by somebody other than NIST. So not that I'm slamming NIST, I like them a lot. Um, uh, common sense uh, is the is the second item here, and this is in the non technical area, right? Um, I, I think the you have to move some accountability to, to to registrars, um, I find it amazing that we we uh, are, are uh, willing to um, that we're not willing to vet people who want a domain who want to own a domain for some fashion. Um, we essentially give one to somebody who gives you a credit card number. Um, this is a public resource. It seems to me that there should be some accountability if you're setting one up. Um, and then lastly, you know, things uh, bullying the ISPs a little bit. Um, there's no good reason why. NetBIOS traffic needs to travel over the wide internet. It just doesn't. Um, you know, SSH maybe, HTTP, sure. Um, I'd ban FTP, FTP on general principle, but some people are probably going to use it. Um, you know, this SMTP, sure. Um, but, but there's a lot of stuff that just doesn't need to go over. Um, <coughs> and then public policy. I, I happen to think that, that all this bleeding about, about user education misses the point, uh, and that education without accountability is a losing battle. So, but that's well outside the scope of this. So, um, I'm just going to talk two quick slides on, on, the, on the herd intelligence model. I'll tell you, you know, this is how AV works today, right? Malware lab gets a sample from their vast net of, of detection nodes, goes into a lab. The lab creates this, uh, create, generates a signature using combination of humans and automated methods. It goes to an update service. That, serv that information uh, gets distributed out to the various nodes. The assumptions in the model it's top down, it's command and control. Um, it assumes that you can detect, um, quote unquote, all malware through whatever set of captive honeypots or detectors you have, uh, or that people will send them to you or what have you. It assumes you can f quickly cycle it through your lab and get a signature out. It assumes you can distribute those rules efficiently. And it also assumes on the client side that you can actually figure out a way to keep all this stuff in memory and process it, process it effectively and efficiently on the client endpoint. 
Um, and as we've seen, you know, if you've got a million signatures on your local PC node, there's, you know, at a certain point, the laws of computer science come into effect and you, you start to have uh, performance issues. There's the old joke about, uh, thank God we have dual processors now because we need one of them to run the antivirus software. Anybody heard that? Okay. Um, the weaknesses is that you don't have any feedback from the endpoints. You don't know who's infected. You don't necessarily know what's even going on in those nodes. Um, the labs are susceptible to denial of service, as I mentioned. And um, the most important point here is that the enemy is using their scale, their infinite ability to scale the number of variants against the finite capacity of the labs. I mean, that is essentially really what's going on here. The herd model combines uh, bottom-up with uh, behavior blocking and, and cloud storage. And, and just walking through it here, um, I happen to like herds, I think, because I just like the metaphor. There's, this has also been called collective intelligence. Um, I like herds better. I think maybe because I like cows. I don't know. Um, but the idea here is very simple. You have some, some node out, out in the field. It detects uh, a request to run a program that it hasn't seen before. Uh, it then makes a check into the cloud to see whether this is something that ought to be running or ought not to be running, whether it's good or bad. The cloud sends, uh, sends the result back to the end node. If it happens to be bad, if they've determined that it's related to a bad program, you can quickly circulate information out to the other nodes. The exceptions then are the things that go to the labs. Now, one could argue that this isn't a prevention strategy so much as it is a detection strategy. And I think that's a fair characterization of this. Um, I've seen, we've seen a couple vendors that are really going down this path. Uh, Panda's doing this, Prevex is doing this, ESET is doing this. Symantec has been making noises about it. Um, but the, o the idea is that you're arming your endpoints, you're turning them into, into collectors uh, a as a way of making the entire network smarter and much more responsive. There, there is precedent for this end user anti spam that's Yep, that's right. Um, Microsoft has this with SpyNet. Thank you, Mike. Um, Cloud works. And CloudMark does this on a spam on the, it's yes. Yep. The the uh, um, do you you're the um, I'm in cloud. I work cloud. no no I, I know that but what's the service do, you, do you, is it your own service do you use um, we sell to a bunch of our people yeah okay because there's a there's an Israeli company whose name I'm forgetting Comtouch um, they they kind of do this for spam but the idea is you you feed everybody feeds in information to a central place uh, and then you you send rules back out to all the to all the end nodes so certainly if it works in the in the spam world. Uh, it, it stands a chance of at least um, contributing, shall we say, to the, to the end point. Thank you, Mr. Rothman. Thank you, Mr. O'Donnell. Um, I've mentioned metrics before uh, about why, why I think we need them. The idea is that if you, uh, when you run something that is essentially cloud-based, you have the advantages of, that a managed service can give you on the scale standpoint. Um, and that means you can do some very interesting things with the data you aggregate in scale. Uh, you can report on it, you can slice and dice, you can benchmark, you can cut by geography, you can cut by company size, um, you can cut by any number of things. It, it, it assumes you have enough telemetry in order to make decisions, um, but it is absolutely a, an increased benefit, and I see it going hand in hand with the herd model here. So uh, there are some things that you need as part of this. There's a scrubbing and anonymization process. Uh, there's rich analytics, there's the ability to create information in, in various consumable formats, be it database, PDF, HTML, and so forth. But infection data sharing and benchmarking, I think, is part and parcel uh, of this, either within the confines of a vendor's own service or industry-wide. Either way, you're going to get scale benefits out of doing this. So, so the now we come to the third part of the presentation, and that is what, what, what do vendors need to do here? I've given you an idea of kind of the technology and, and what vendors need to do. I was hoping this would get a laugh because, because the slide here is instructing vendors to pray. But in reality, they probably should do something other than just pray. So we'll, we'll, we'll try, we'll try and, and talk a little bit about the preconditions. Now, but it's worth asking a question here. Why, why have, why have uh, the, the vendors that I've, I've been uh, critiquing today enjoy the success they have? And the answer, of course, is that it's, it relates in part to marketing and, and in part of fulfilling a need. If you look at the, at, um, I just watched Blood Diamond last weekend, so this is sort of why I put this on the slide, but um, it, can you think of a more successful industry than 
the diamond industry or the antivirus industry in convincing you that you need something, right? I've mentioned before that, uh, yeah, but not 100% of people have crack. 100% of addicts probably have crack. Not 100% of the population. Thank you, Mr. Tan. Um, so, we've, so the idea here is that there's a need fulfillment that goes on and is part of why the companies have been successful. So the next question. Financially successful. Financially successful. So the next question, how do, how do AV vendors view security? Well, if, if you look at, at security as viewed by many of the AV companies, it's a desktop product. Um, you open a shrink wrap box, you put a CD in the drive, you install the software, uh, and bingo, problem solved. In other words, it's, the, it's one of these. It's a silver bullet. It's the kind of thing that you don't need to do anything other than buy this magic project and product and install it. So I'm going to give you some example of some claims. And I just pulled these up just the other day. Uh, this is uh, Panda Security. You can see this if, you, if you're reading in the back. Automatically and detects and eliminates all types of viruses. That's a pretty, pretty uh, huge claim. Um, McAfee is a little more conservative. They tell you that they have six in one PC protection. Six, six, six types in one. Um, Kasper Kasper uh, Kaspersky. Sorry to single out the gentleman here in, in the room. Uh, all internet threats, again, a pretty big claim. Everything. <laughs> I won't tell you where that's coming from, by the way. It's not this geography. No, I, I don't. Oh, I forgot the best part. Uh, the best part was, um, I sort of forgot about this, but I don't know if you can see that. Mega detection. Not to be confused with poor detection. <laughs> <laughs> or good protection, but you know, even better. This is like detection at 11. <laughs> so, okay, so true story. Uh, October 2004 at Cambridge, Massachusetts in a certain battery ventures back startup. Isn't it great that Aztec is getting acquired? Yeah, maybe our options will be worth something. Who's the buyer? Yeah. Symantec. Why? They're not a security company. <laughs> I, couldn't make the, I couldn't make this up. And, and this is because the, ad, the attitude was, you know, these folks sell desktop software. Now, security as, sold, as spewed by security people think a little differently. They think about three phases, prevention, detection, response. What AV is good at is protection, and it's how it's marketed. If, if what you market is silver bullets, then you, are, then you are damning yourself to live and die by that first item. Where the industry is moving to is here, detection and response. And there are a number of, of startups and a number of service-based companies, I mentioned support intelligence, that are getting good at this. Mike Rothman, the, the somewhat rambunctious gentleman in the back, likes to say, react faster. Is that right? Exactly. And this is, this is part and parcel of that message, react faster, detect faster. Now, if, if, if all you do is think that protection helps you, there's a great metaphor for this. You're putting all your eggs in one basket. So in my view, where we need to go from a market perspective, an industry perspective, uh, is this is advice to the vendors, unsolicited, as is much of my advice. De-emphasize protection in favor of detection and response. Market belts and suspenders, not silver bullets. And do it in a real way that isn't the sort of generic, well, security's a process. Of course it's a process. Are there other things you can do besides just claim that you, that you do miracles? Discover telemetry. Find context in the, in the applications that are running on your machines. Use the information to build better, better software instead of the top-down, no feedback model that we have today. Uh, benchmarking. Experiences in the field. What's working, what's not. Detection rates and response times and the labor costs associated with cleanups. This would go a long way, in my view, to getting a lot more real about the problems we're facing. Share data widely. This goes back to the, this is the fantastic part of the recommendations as in fantasy. Share field data widely, even among your competitors. And the last thing is, is educate customers. There's, that's, I put that last because I think it's the least important. So what, what, do, we, what do we have here? Let's, let's conclude with, with a few things. Um, I, I hope I've it, 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 um, maybe not persuaded you, but at the very least argued in an entertaining way that the current situation isn't working, that the, the anti-malware defenses that, we all, that we've all grown up and learned to uh, 
love are not keeping pace, um, that the threat profiles are a lot different. They're, they're coming more fast, more furious. Uh, and that the top-down model is a weak link. I hope I've persuaded you, or at least uh, argued in an entertaining way, that we've got some new approaches that are heading our way r relating to the herd model, uh, behavior blocking, uh, and, and some of the other technologies that are coming along. Um, I hope I've made a case here for better analysis and detection, um, the ability to benchmark, and that we need to move beyond the silver bullet mindset of prevention trumps everything and that we don't need to worry about these other items. Um, and, and I think the last bullet of consequence here is that if you're an enterprise, and, and I talk to many, is, is that um, you're going to see more and better tools around this whole notion of detection and response, uh, and, and that these are going to become much more mainstream than we, than we have. So my advice to enterprises here in the room is get ready for it. Uh, it's, it's either going to cause you to spend more money or going to certainly cause you to, to uh, look at the portfolio of controls that you have. So that's, that's really all I've got. Um, thank you very much, and I would love to entertain questions, or at the very least, repel them back with wit. <laughs> yes? Uh, do, you, do, you see, uh, do you see much uh, use for the open source movement in, in doing this? Um, I do. Um, I mean, you've you certainly seen like Snort do quite well in the IDS world, so I, I don't see any reason why you couldn't do that. Um, you know, the, the, I think the one issue that you might see, though, is that the VCs have kind of figured out that there needs to be a bigger, a bigger safety net. Um, and so you see companies like Dumbala and non-VC-backed places like Support Intelligence, um, and a number of the others who are starting to get uh, funded, right? So anytime you've got good venture funding, um, that will tend to divert attention away from the open source, but it could also help it as well. So I mean, didn't, certainly didn't hurt the Snort folks. So, so that was a non-answer, I'm sorry. The answer is it depends. Mr. Rothman. Um, I see where you're. I see where you're headed with that line of questioning, um, and I'm and I'm going to hedge, but not for the reason you think. Um, here's the thing: the the security companies. Um, it's it's not an indictment of what they do so much as it is an indictment of the marketing, the way the products are sold, right? And and I, I really, I mean, I I put up that that slightly embellished at stake acquisition conversation for fun. I, I'll, I was actually a party to that, so. I was half of that conversation. Um, uh, the they're not a security company comment, um, and and the, you know the reason I put it up was because that it, it really is. I really do feel there's a desktop software mindset about a lot of this stuff, and that is that it's it's all about magic bullets. So the the indictment here is that we need to we need to stop talking about mega detection. We need to talk about stop talking about bulletproof defenses, and we need to, to look at a at a balanced diet. I mean, if you look at the FDA food pyramid, right? Nobody would suggest that all you do is eat mozzarella sticks all day, right? You've got to balance that diet with some other things. And, and so that diet needs to have more than just the, the, the cheese of, uh, of bulletproof detection and a lot more of the fiber and, <laughs> and vegetables that comes with the uh, detection and response. So, uh, so I think that's the, that's the key thing. Yes? Can I just say, I I heard was about four or five years behind what the industry is actually doing. So I, I, I think Andrew's catching up to where the companies are actually doing. Oh, no. I'll just, have to, I, I'll I I'll just put that out there. I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah. I don't know who you're yeah. talking to. Yeah. Andrew's point is semantic markets a silver bullet, and McAfee does, and every antivirus yeah. vendor does. 
The fact is there was a lot of stuff underneath the covers, but Symantec doesn't talk about that, and none of the antivirus right. do because of a fairly important thing. Users don't care. Consumers don't care. Well, they want to that's install something, right? and like they that's probably know that. Well, Alan, I mean, and you and you you make a good point. There there are some things, you know, and I've I've, I've mentioned them in passing. You know, there are um, Symantec has done has has done some things, certainly with some acquisitions they've done and some and some technology. It's true that there are some things going on. However, um, I, I think there's some of the easy stuff has been done, but not some of the hard stuff. I'll give you an example of the hard stuff. Um, if we're talking about telemetry, in other words, getting real detailed information about what endnodes are doing, so you can actually make uh, smart decisions and feeding that back to a, a central service. That involves sending detailed information back outside a company's firewall to some mother ship. That's a tough proposition and I haven't seen anybody bite off and tackle that issue from a communication standpoint and education standpoint. Um, and, and because that hasn't been bit off, there's a very limited amount of feedback that goes into this. I don't doubt that there are efforts to collect information from these endnotes. But what, it hasn't been, what hasn't been done in scale uh, is the idea of, of actually watching all of your customers, every single end node, in an attempt to, to get a, a, a much richer sense of what's running, what isn't. Um, again, there's a lot, there is a lot of stuff, and, and I get pushback on this from vendors who say, oh, you know, you're not giving us credit for, well, I kind of am, but uh, the, the, the easy things have been done, not the hard things. And on the marketing side, it's still magic bullets. Still magic bullets. I see this. I mean, I talk to your marketing people all the time, and it's a lot of magic bullets, man. <laughs> yeah. Well, this, this, you wrote a story on this not that long ago, so you. I think I think anti-botnet stuff is detection, detection and response is falls into the detection category of things. In other words, what we need to do more of. It strikes me as a feature more than a, a dedicated market per se, but it'll be a market for a while. You know, in the same way that that spyware was a good market and it got the participants in it. There were early some reasonably nice exits. Um, so, I, I think you'll see it be a small market for a while. I do think it's going to get subsumed. Again, uh, I, I want I want something not to be lost here, which is that that part of this is about the industry growing up, I think. It's, it's about being smarter and about being more honest with your customers. Um, that's what this is about. And so, if, it, it, so a lot of the, what comes across as, as fairly tough and savage love here is really meant to, make, make that just tough, um, is really meant to just be uh, as a way of suggesting that we're, we're gonna get beyond the, the, the silver bullet. Adam? Well, I, I think there's two sides to this. If you look at, you know, o on an OEM standpoint, um, you have companies that have taken distributed threat information, cloud, um, cloud mark, you know, using, for instance, ComTouch as an example. Clearly, it was valuable enough for you guys to OEM, right? Oh, uh, there's a different company, our competitor. Okay. Yeah, we have our own stuff. We detect it, stop spam. Okay. So, all right, let me answer the question a different way then. Um, Information has a value, right? Information with high um, currency demands. You know, there's a reason why the instant stock quotes you pay a certain amount, whereas the de 20 second delayed stock quotes you pay le you pay less or get for free. Right? So, so that seriously real time information will always have a value. More broadly speaking, though, I think the the information you get in scale from from doing uh, wide data collection on things like infection rates. Um, and program executions and things like that has a value more in the thought leadership category. If you look at uh, a McKinsey Consulting, for instance, um, they will publish things in McKinsey Quarterly about benchmarking studies they've done of their customer bases. 
Um, do you have to pay to get that information from McKinsey? Not really, because you can simply download the PDF and read it, or pay a nominal fee, right? So the monetization is very neutral. What it does give them, though, is thought leadership. It means that you're going to view them as the source of authoritative information, and you're going to go to them first and maybe call up one of their consultants and, and do an engagement. And, and I would like to think that in the information security world, that kind of information has a real value in terms of establishing a pedigree and making you seem credible. I mean, there's a reason, frankly, why Symantec, and I'm going to give them some, a lot of credit here, there's a reason why their internet security threat report is widely cited in just about every news media outlet. It's because it's credible, because they do it regularly, and they, you know, they, they provide a lot of information there. Um, so, you know, I think that's kind of what you get out of it. The, the monetization is indirect, in other words. Yes, Mr. Mogul. Isn't this, both sides of this approach, basically fundamentally flawed? All we're ever going to be able to do is be reactive. You know, this, the, the herd mentality is going to have some of the similar difficulties with yeah. uh, some of the targeted attacks that we're seeing today. What, is there any impetus for the anti-malware industry to move beyond uh, a detection and response capability in order to uh, prevent the globe? Are we going to see that, or is it the fact that basically we get down to a customer who wants to go up and buy the new marketing, and there's going to be no market driver for them to develop that technology? So I'm not sure if I understood your question, if the, which is that they're, they're in a preventative mode now, right? right? Now it's more of this reactive mode. So even the herd model relies on us getting some sort of a signature-based example right. of that negative behavior. But in many cases, by the time we capture that signature, it's too late. That's right. And so it, it's that herd. I mean, the problem with the herd model is, is you know, the animals still die. That's right. The predators are, are kind of on the edge. Nobody wants to be that predator on the edge. So. Is there, what can the anti-malware industry do, or what do you think in terms of um, taking more of a preventative model as yeah. opposed to waiting for one of the cattle to get killed? Well, cattle die every day. <laughs> so there's no motivator for you us said to look you at like cows. basically doing anything differently. I mean, are we, we're basically accepting our losses. I think you, I think you have to. I mean, there's no, there's no way you can spend, if you spend infinite amount of, of money, um, you might be able to stop things. But of course, you, you don't have infinite money. So uh, it's a question of where you want to put your emphasis uh, in, in terms of dollars. I, I think we're, we're w too overweighted in terms of the prevention side. Of it's really detection, but it's marketed to prevention. Um, it's very, very late detection in some cases, right? I think we're too overweighted in that. We need to move our strategies to other areas. But it seems like that speeds up the signature part, as opposed to basically it's reinforcing the signature-based approach as opposed to moving more towards prevention-based technology, which, by the way, are not going to be so local either. Right. Right? Cattle are, you know, people are still going to get ticked off on the edges, even with that model. Which, in terms of what the market drivers want, because that's what's going to yeah. move guys like the man taking the trees and the next silver bullet or whoever else, you know, what do you think the emphasis is going to be? Is it going to drive them more towards this herd mentality, or is it going to be more hits-based approaches on the endpoints? Yeah. Anti-exploitation technologies. Yeah. Which of those different approaches do you think? Well, I think they've all got part of it. I did. I did allude to and didn't spend a lot of time on on host intrusion prevention as an aspect of this that makes a lot of sense. I mean, there are certain things. You know, if you see an executable within the within this herd model, right? If it's Internet Explorer and it's trying to spawn a command shell, it probably shouldn't do that, right? So, I mean, that's a one of these heuristic rules that you can just say um, this lends itself well to detecting whether something's probably badness, right? So I think there's, there's, a, there's a mix of host intrusion features, heuristics on the endpoint, combined with cloud knowledge, I think gets you a little further along the way. Nothing's bulletproof. So the end question I probably should ask first, so you do see signature base still being of value? Yeah, yeah. The yeah. signature base antivirus is dead, it just it needs to it, it's mute. It needs to mutate, it needs to grow a cloud appendage, uh, and it needs to to incorporate feedback from all the endpoints. Yeah. So I'd just like to make a comment as a vendor. Um, I, I think antivirus is a misnomer. I don't think any of the major products, and certainly if you look at the product mix in terms of what sells the security suites versus yeah. straight antivirus, it's clearly have a much more heavily weighted towards the security suites. The security suite signature is just one facet. I mean, it is heuristics, it is hips, that's right. sandboxing, it is emulation. I mean, there's all these other technologies that are becoming part of that standard core foundation. Um, 
and signatures are just there, quite honestly, in many cases, to speed up the process, to say, yeah, I can quickly say 80% of this stuff is good. I'm going to use all this other more sophisticated technology. Yep, absolutely fair point. Any other questions? I think everybody's been quite kind to me today. Just a comment. Um, You know, that's a, great, that's a great question and a great point, which is, and I agree with it, but, um, but there's a second part. I, I've kind of made the statement that maybe I'll, what I'll do is I'll flip, flip back here. Maybe I won't flip back because it's, it's uh, going to take forever. But um, here's the thing. The, the, with, end, with end users, the, the, the challenge with end users is getting them to care. And education is wasted unless there are, there are essentially incentives or penalties related that cause them to care. So but I guess we, I guess we agree on that. Malware changes that because even careful users will now get hit. So, so the end users are part of the, part of the problem, sure. But we can't just bash on them. They're all downloading this AV software. Okay, yeah. they're they're buying into the hype, perhaps. But when you're going yeah. to, if, even if you're following state computing practices, you go to a website that you trust and you get hit by a rootkit. You know why? How are how are you to blame for that? And and frankly, most users don't follow safe computing practices. They use whatever's default is the most is the is the, uh, the thing that rules their behavior. So. And, the, and the reality is McAfee has some internal research that 70 to 80 percent of the end users install and forget. Install That's right. Forget. They never look at that product that's installed. Yeah. So you need to get one yeah. shot at the... Yeah. <laughs> Well, here, here's the thing. I mean, and this is a user incentives, right? If if my identity gets stolen, and I use an on and I use eBay or something, or somebody uses eBay on my behalf, right, and causes my credit card to get debited for 50, for you know 100 bucks or whatever, I usually don't have to pay that because the credit card companies are competing on how much how many refunds they can give you, basically, right? So there's no incentive. Why should a user care if they don't actually have to bear any cost of the consequence? I think that's the that's the point to the gentleman in the back there. User education without incentives is wasted. That's that's kind of my, my standpoint on this. So uh, maybe they would, to Steve, to your point, maybe they would uh, follow better practices if they were, you know, um, safe a little more, surf a little more safely. But even if they're applying patches and so on, the game has changed, and that's part of the point I'm trying to make. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah that's true also. Yes, uh, and, and Alan asked, asked a, a question earlier, and part of my reply was, I don't think a lot of that hard stuff has been done yet. So. But I mean, once the industry matures and develops the software, right. the Yeah, that's, I, I, that, is in part, that is part of the challenge of why, this, why we're not there yet. And what we need to do is we need to recognize there's going to be information that you need to transmit back. That information, you're absolutely right, is, and I glossed over this in the slides, I think companies are contractually obligated to protect their confidential information. Some of that could be interpreted as such. Therefore, part of your challenge in terms of moving the industry forward is getting people to understand that 
some of that information is going to be needed for diagnostic purposes, for malware purposes, and whatnot. And it means, you know, frankly, as much as I hate to say it, educating enterprises that this stuff is coming. Right? That's some part, some of the really hard part that has yet to be done yet. So, we'll, you know, we'll get there. I mean, part of this, part of the point of this talk was to sort of suggest where we might go as part of this. And, you know, uh, I think five years ago, Dan Gear said, stood up on a stage, and, or maybe it might have been 10 years, said, automatic update is coming to client PCs. People say, oh, that's crazy. You know, you can't do that. How, you, the bandwidth and, you know, it's going to require end users to patch. And what about enterprise? Well, guess what? A lot of enterprises allow clients to directly contact Microsoft and patch their PCs. So some of this stuff, there's precedent for some of this. So, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll get there. It's going to take a while. You just patch the executable to DLL, then go patch the file. Mostly, most of our customers. We done? I, yeah, I think we're, um, okay. we're out of time, so I'm sure Andy like would, you know, like to have conversations with people. Yeah, so thanks everybody for coming. Thanks for packing the room. George is my boss. George is your boss. George used to work.